Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proof. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Richard C. Lyons, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Richard's a busy, busy man, so we've got him just for a few short minutes today. We'll for sure have you back on. You wrote a book called The DNA of Democracy and kind of just talked about the, you know, the, the makings of a democracy and where it comes from in the history. Uh, and I thought it was such a fantastic book as I read through it. I mean, it just you really got to the building blocks of everything. So everybody should check that out. Look in the show notes. You'll see the DNA of democracy in there. Uh, and actually get any of Richard's books because they're all well written. But um, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you back on is, is uh, it's a very tumultuous time in our democracy. I, I, but our democracy is quite strong, you know, like it's protected by documents and a lot of history. What are your just general thoughts going in in terms of we're less than just just over a month out of the election? What are your thoughts today here in 2020? Well, as I've been um, researching for the next volume of this series, which is more uh, the modern era, uh, I find our government has has concentrated itself at the federal level and within the executive branch. And I believe this is why so many persons are hot tempered today, why there are demonstrations, why the focus is critically on on the judicial branch as uh, a branch of government that's appointed through the executive. The reasons for that are that we don't feel fully representative any any longer, Pete, because our representation has been taken out by agencies at the federal level where we're not represented at all. And also um, through judicial fiat, judicial edict, where laws are created through the judicial branch by negating representative law. Um, so I think this is a critical juncture uh, where either we're going to become even more concentrated in, at the federal level or devolve perhaps to where the states, you know, guide themselves. At. That's okay. Hey, so one of the things that went through uh, via the Supreme Court, and again, this is not a knock on this thing, but it's, it's uh, I'm pointing my finger squarely at the legislature, but the gay marriage was basically decided via judicial fiat rather than you know, independent states or some kind of federal legislation. It was done through the courts. Is that what you're talking about? That's exactly what I'm talking about. And it goes to abortion and many other issues where um, laws were created in each state to deal with uh, certain moral issues. And those moral issues were taking a, taken away from the state level and, and the people's representatives. And uh, just a judicial edict was said that you cannot challenge the fact that there is abortion on demand and there is gay marriage throughout the country now. Yeah. And again, the legislators refuse to uh, solve these problems. So, you know, they get to wipe their hands clean of it. But yeah, we're still talking about abortion almost 50 years after Roe v. Wade. And, and mm -hmm. again, this is no statement pro or against abortion, but right. how we're set up, the, you know, the, there is a morality problem. This is the thing I, I quite often say about abortion. I, I don't care where on the the stool you stand, but it's a three-legged stool. You're compromising somebody's rights, either the unborn human, the right. woman, because the government shouldn't tell the woman that they have to have a baby. I understand that. <laughs> right. But right. also, we've completely ripped away the rights of, of a dude. What if you want to become a dad? What if you don't want to become a dad? All of a sudden, you're compelled by this three-legged stool that should really be decided locally, you know? Yeah, I hadn't I hadn't regarded that aspect, but that's very true. Um, and these are moral issues. Normally, these were dealt with uh, by your synagogue or your church or, you know, you discussed it in your religious, spiritual community. Even if you're a humanist, you would discuss it on that level. Uh, but it's being taken away. And that's part of the problem. It's been taken away and made uh, a legal matter. Yeah, and and again, it becomes a political thing where someone's claiming the mor the moral high ground, but there is no moral high ground to this. You've got three hilltops, and and each one of them, you know, 
I'm I'm pro abortion. I don't call it pro choice. I just call it pro abortion up until a certain point. I don't know when that point is, but I'm glad to have that discussion. Like we shouldn't be aborting babies that are two weeks out, you know, or three weeks out. I don't know where that line is, but there's a line there for me personally. Again, I'm not saying I'm, I'm absolutely for abortion. But I, th- I think it, there's a lot of circumstances when it's the best of the shittiest options, but. It's uh, that's not how we do it, you know, and we play around. So some states have a hard, you know, are going for this hard, uh, you know, ban on it. And then other places are probably too liberal. I think our, our nation's always about balance. And isn't that sort of what a democracy? That's has a very to be? that's a that's a very key issue. And that's why I'm discussing this about with regard to this election, whereas before many things were decided locally or at the county level or at the state level or they were decided by your religious affiliation, your affinity, right, on moral matters. But now all these matters that were once decided among people democratically or spiritually are now being assigned to the federal government. Uh, The federal government used to not have anything to do with what a person believed. And now we're being told what is right and what is wrong by by a too concentrated uh, government, my feeling. I, I believe the government has grown too great at the federal level. I mean, I, I think you're right. And when you look at their, if you were to look, if they had a batting average, we would we would all be like, it might be some bench time for you guys because, you know, you're just <laughs> not doing that well. well this, yeah, this is what the second volume is about. It's about how do you keep from taking power over different areas of society as a government because you have the power to do it? I want to what get, keeps you from doing it? Yeah. And that would be the Constitution. But that's being trampled over lately. Let's so. let's cover a couple of things within the, within the Constitution and the Supreme Court. Then, since we're on that topic, uh, Todd brings up a great question: When did America start to look at the Supreme Court as the lawmakers and not, you know, adjudicators of law and conflict? So, go ahead and answer that, and then I'll ask my next Supreme Court question. Well, I think it was the Roe v. Wade was the biggest uh, flashpoint in and the. The judicial branch is just supposed to take laws generated by the legislature and approved by the executive and say, is this in keeping with the Constitution or not? Uh, In Roe v. Wade, they adapted the 14th Amendment to assure privacy, which assured abortion, which is a tangling of of law. And so it, it took from the people's representatives their right to choose per state uh, whether they would be allowing of abortion or no. So uh, I thought I think that was the flashpoint. That's why this is so critical now and why the fight is so animated uh, with regard to this open seat. When you look at the makeup of the court, you know, right now we're looking at a possible 6-3 divide between what the Republicans want and what the uh, Democrats want. And I, I can understand that. But in terms of the Constitution, it doesn't appear to be any problem with the president picking somebody and the Senate working to confirm them. Is it, I mean, that's just like the black and white of the thing. Everything else kind of becomes politics. But but also, what about the, when the president, I, I mean, I like the fact that he put out a list, like, here are my justices. Go ahead and start pre-vetting yeah. them now. I love right. that. I don't like that Joe Biden doesn't do that. Um, I'm okay-ish with saying, hey, we're going to pick a female, you know, of this. Like, I'd, they're all qualified, so it kind of doesn't matter. It's like, yeah, sweet, we're losing a female. Let's get one. Maybe also because we're not just a black and white nation. Let's put somebody from Asia in there or whatever. I, I, yeah. I sort of like those things. But in terms of the makeup of this, can we ever get away from a politicized Supreme Court, or is it always going to be this battle for supremacy? Well, again, as long as – well, here, here's the – Here's my conception of it. In the Congress, you have 435 representatives in the House, and you have 100 representative senators in the Senate, right? So you have 535 people plus the president. So there's some breadth of representation. In the Supreme Court, there are nine persons, right? And it's become now a super legislative body. So that's a very concentrated body, and they are split right down the middle. So When you have such a relationship, it seems to me that's the point of contention. And so every single seat, if you can imagine, is like 50 representatives, right, if you if you do the math. So it's a very concentrated body, which affects a lot of society by by their judicial edicts. So, of course, that's like whether you like a king or you don't like a king. 
Well, if you do or you don't, it's very passionate because he rules uh, in a manner that's uh, forceful. I want to come back to the King thing, but I want to, for one more second, stick on the Supreme sure. Court. The, you know, we can look at how judges decide things, and it's 100% legitimate to say, I want strict constitutionalist people that look at this as like a hard guide. And then it's also 100% fine if you're the president to say, I want someone who adapts what was written into a modern context. And that way that gives you your, your Kagans and your, your, your Thomases, right? And then in the middle, maybe you have someone that, you know, like John Roberts has lately been, you know, he's been the deciding vote. But can we just... Can we just segment judges by their judicial history and say this person is a seven or a four and we need a four right now. We don't need a nine, you know, or whatever it is. I guess that depends on your point of view, which you just mentioned. Do I want an activist judge or do I want one who's, you know, textual, a textual judge who relies on the Constitution and says this is the law brought to us by the legislature and approved by the executive? Is it within constitutional guidelines. And that's what a judge is ideally supposed to do. Now, the other view is uh, we can reject laws that we don't like, Mm -hmm. even though the legislature and executive have have given them to us. And it could be a law that was created in 1960 Uh and they can reject it, you know. (laughs) So if brought back, you know, challenged in the appeal. This uh, this has happened this year, and it was funny because, and I'm going to be critical of the left right now. Everybody threw up their hands and was convinced that this horrible court was going to find um, against the the discrimination side for for that law from the '60s that talked about how you could how, what you could and couldn't do discriminatory wise, and at the time, gender and and sexual proclivity it wasn't. It wasn't a thing in the, that they were worried about. And so the court yeah. was brought this case to say, help us sort this legislation out. And so the left instantly said, it's going to go horribly. It's going to go against us. In fact, <laughs> it didn't. But the court did their job. They were like, OK, does this law still apply today? And if not, it's not a loss. It's like, OK, now we go to the legislation and say, hey, you need to yeah. update this law. I mean, that's exactly what the court is supposed to do, by my understanding of it. Yes, by mine, too. Let the legislature, who are the representatives of the people, right. uh, determine what the law should be because they're answerable. They're elected and uh, they're the closest. The House of Representatives was created as it was created to be the closest to the populations they represent and to and to create law in their interest. And so every two years, if, if your representative has put forward or approved a law you don't like, you can change your representative. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Put forward or approved a law you don't like, you can change your representative. That's that's how it ideally works. And if they want to change a law from 1960, yeah. let them vote again. Yeah. Uh, and then the Senate, of course, has that root of sen, you know, seniority, senior, senility, all those things. <laughs> it was supposed to be. And that's a bit of a crack, but um, it was supposed to be the branch of wisdom. Like we've been here. We, you know, we're looking out for the other aspects of these things. And I, I think we've lost our way in that. The House has um, celebrities, which I don't think, I mean, that's not uncommon, but we shouldn't have celebrity influencing what we all want to do. And then also it seems like, um, well, I, I'll just say it, like when when hard legislative decisions are happening, no one's able to whip together the votes to get these things through. We're, we're very ineffective, you know, so. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the legislature in general in terms of what they're supposed to be doing? Are they doing a good job? What grade would you give them? That's my question. Um, I think they ceded a lot of power uh, to the executive branch and all the myriad agencies that are that exist there and just rubber stamp things that are regulations. I had a number uh, during the Obama administration that in one year, 2,300 le- regulations, which are law, uh, were approved. And 132 laws were created by Congress. So if you see that disparity, you're again, you're not being represented. 
regulations are coming out of agencies and they're just edicts that are telling you how to act if you're in one sort of business or another, or whether you can go into a federal park or not. Um, so it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a difference in a shift of power that has taken place and the legislature, uh, has the power to allow the agencies that power or to take it back. I think they ought to be taking it back. I want to point my finger squarely at the president or the presidency, uh, maybe is probably more accurate, but let me, let me take a crack at president Trump here. Uh, I am not at all comfortable with his acceleration and increase of executive orders and he's also bragging on his deregulation efforts, but he's not done that. As far as I understand it, he's not done that through the legislature where they're taking things off the books. He's doing it through presidential fiat. Um, right. That creates opportunities for, for, you know, left, right, left, right, left, right, just chaos. Like you've built your life and your business upon these set of rules. And someone comes in and says, never mind all of that. I'm going to spend this trillion dollars. I'm going to do that. I mean, when was the last time Congress declared a war? However, in absence of action <laughs> right. by the legislature, the executive, I guess, is saying, if you guys won't do it, I will try to stop me. Yeah, I agree completely. The The idea of presidential uh, uh, powers like that, it's become a bad habit. Executive orders have become a really bad habit. Uh, and uh, it is, frankly, in the executive uh, in the executive's power to rule over the agencies. And I think uh, that's part of the difficulty. They can do what they like without, uh, without legislative consent. So yeah, the power has become so packed in the executive office. It has become such a cherry. I compare it to uh, the ring in the Lord of the Rings. Mm. It drives everybody crazy. <laughs> Whether they own the ring or they don't own the ring, yeah. it drives them crazy. So when it's so concentrated in one ring or one office, one person, uh, it, it creates a great reaction. Our, if you've read the book, uh, Pete, as you have, um, our concept of government started as the exact opposite. Right. All the powers that affected you were right in your neighborhood. All the big decisions were made right there. The only contact you had with a federal government was in a time of war, an emergency. Uh and now the opposite has occurred, and yeah. it, it just goes to the the nature of government, the nature of power. It collects power. Yeah, and then it partners with other power. You know, like, for right. example, we probably have too much uh, institutional influence with corporations. You know, I mean, that wasn't the intent. In yeah, I was just reading a, a very interesting research about the next volume. During the Depression, um, they started the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and they began by partnering with Su Commonwealth and Southern, which was the utility company working in the South. And they started, they began as friends. Hey, we're going to help you out. You're going to, you're going to love us. We're going to give you more power to sell. Da, 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 da. They started as a partner, then became the dominant partner and then devoured them <laughs> and, and then regulated others out of business. Yeah. where they just created laws to benefit themselves. Whenever you're in business with the government, you're going to lose if you're a competitor. And there, I guess the, the other not a winning solution, the counter to that is, is whenever you're, you know, whenever you privatize something, you know, poor people lose. I mean, in general, poor people yeah. always get the short stick. So again, we're, we're stuck with the balance, you know, we have to balance enough governmental control to control the corporations. But right now we seem to be like, why don't you guys play together and do whatever the hell you want? <laughs> Are you talking about the media giants now? The high yes, tech companies? All of them. Uh, defense yeah. industry, the the you know, I don't like to say the words big pharma because I don't know what medium farm is, but all of these places and the president, you know, to his credit, uh, is saying, Hey, uh, knock it off. Um, we're not gonna have big US wars, we're not gonna invest in these things. Hey, um, pharmaceutical yeah. companies, I want your help on these problems, but um we're gonna get real transparent on what things cost and we're gonna so I like that attitude, you know, and, and I don't know if those things will work out, but I have to give Trump a high five for those things. But the corporations hate it. And then their uh, government lackeys, for a better term, they hate it. And they're getting a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, it's uh, the key word I, you mentioned, Pete, was balance. There used to be a balance between governance at the local level, governance at the state level and governance uh, at the federal level. And now it's quite out of balance. And so uh, things become 
unpredictable. Why? Because 365 people aren't determining things. Thousands of people aren't determining things. One person's determining things. And how, you know, the government's going to react to a certain industry. So the balance is kind of struck off. Going back a few minutes in our conversation, we were talking about it, um, you know, the things like were really truly like a republic type thing where, okay, we're all going to stand around the tree, we're going to make a decision, and this is how our community is going to solve fire, water, roads, whatever it was. We've gotten away from that to the point where we're now having a conversation where a union of teachers um, can't decide where my kid goes to school and I'm not allowed to move my kid and the money that's given through the federal government for some reason to put my kid into a better school. You know, I, I we've gotten so far away that the parents and the institutions are saying they're more important than the thing that they're trying to serve, which we all agree is our future, the kids. Yeah. And, and that's a great another great uh, case in point, Pete, because there was a time uh, some time ago where money was routed via um the income tax, individual income tax, went through government instead of going directly to educators in local, in, in your local community. It used to be the parents who were associated where the PTA comes from. And the PTA would determine who the principal is, who the teachers are, exactly what the curriculum would be for their kids. And now it's routed through the federal government. And if you do not do what the federal government mandates as education, then you don't get the money. So you have no say in it any longer. It the, the decisions are made in Washington D.C. among a few people, and then we uh, we can't we can't stand if the person's not from our party. We can't stand who that person is. They become an idiot dullard, you know, who isn't qualified <laughs> to do the job. But here's the thing: right. I've asked a lot of people this question, like, what makes a good president, or like this uh, Betsy DeVos person, drives the left crazy? And again, I'm picking on the left this time. But if I was to say, speak intelligently about the past 11 secretary of educations and, you know, what it takes to be a good person, they wouldn't know. They wouldn't know the first thing. They couldn't tell you two other secretaries of education. Right. And so we're really driving ourselves insane about stuff we truly don't care or can't be bothered to know anything about, except for we don't like that person's party. Yeah. And they're all concentrated a thousand miles. Well, for me, 1500 miles from here. <laughs> right. Right. And nobody knows who they are, really. They they were never elected. They were appointed. So you don't have the grasp. Oh, that's my congressman. His office is down at this address and I can go talk to him. Now it's a, a mass of agencies, none of whom are elected, that have lifetime appointments uh, as far as uh, persons within the agency, if not the secretary. But uh and it's just too distant. It's too concentrated. They make too many decisions that don't have to be have to do with me. Now, imagine, imagine if we allow the states to be the states. California could do whatever the hell it wanted to do. They could create whatever laws they want to create, right? They can call a monkey a man, a man a monkey. It wouldn't matter what they would do, right? Right? To us, being in Ohio, say we're in Ohio, and Ohio creates its own laws based on the persons in Ohio. We've gotten far, far from that. So it makes Californians angry when somebody in Washington makes a conservative decision. And it makes people in Ohio angry when uh, somebody in the executive makes a decision based on California law. Pato, so it's, uh, Pato Milo put a quote. Pato, you got to shorten them up, buddy. If I put them in, this is what happens. It covers this whole screen. So I'm... <laughs> <laughs> That's a big saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, as we look at these things, it sounds very libertarian, what you're talking about. Would you put what you're writing about anywhere on a political spectrum at all? Or how would you characterize what your, what your research shows? Um, it shows that the original design of our government, I think, per, it's my opinion, yeah. is best. The more, diffusion, uh, the more diffusion of power there is in a society, the more strong all members are, the more respect all members show each other. The more decisions are seen as legitimate, right? Mm -hmm. It just goes down the line. And things that are of, of a spiritual nature shouldn't be a matter for civil government. And that's where all the fighting really happens because you're telling me what to believe or I'm telling you. Yeah. And that, that is not – that's contrary to the original principles of the, of the American government. I mean, for sure, we are deeply divided 
and and really again we we suck at recognizing this but it's really three segments there's the left there's the right and then there's the folks who are like i don't like either of you assholes you know like <laughs> <laughs> no and, and no but listen to that pete there's a large and in america you're not supposed to care yeah you're you're you're, be, you're you should be able to go fishing and not have to care about this stuff you should be able to go to a ball game and be next to a person who might not agree to everything you think yeah but not get a fight over. there is a uh, role I, there is a role that has to be played though by the citizen like we we are often told vote 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 facebook can constantly bugs me to to learn more about voting rights but in reality that is the least you could do as a citizen, like you, if you really want to have power, you should go involve yourself in the government. You don't have to run for office. You could literally volunteer for a committee. You could write to your congressman and say, hey, I know you got work for me. What can I do to help or whatever it is? You could you can get yeah. involved at your church, at an NGO, at a charity, any old thing to be involved and have more individual to protect your rights, to to create the, the area, the utopia that you want to create. Yeah, and again, that can be done locally, and that's the way our government was conceived. And think at the local level, the the proportion of your vote and how impactful it is when you're voting for, say, the mayor of your town. Let's just call it a town. Or at the county level or the state level. Much more impactful than being one of 330 million, Mm -hmm. Uh, right? So. Uh, the more the more decisions are made locally and nearer to the citizen, the more the citizens represented and, and the more the representatives are answerable. I, uh, I also um, am not a fan of how we step over each other's boundaries. Why is Mike Bloomberg investing one hundred million dollars and how the hell is that possible anyhow in Florida to try to tip the election? Excuse me. Like, yeah. like, what are you doing? Why is AOC's yeah. ads coming into my feed? You know, you're not my representative. The person exactly. who is exactly. my representative is is um, Katie Porter, right? And I voted for her last yeah. time. I've sent her two emails and never got a response from her team. So guess what? I, I will not be voting. If you don't, if I can't talk to you, you can't represent me. But right. I'm told by people outside of my district how great she is. Like, really? Apparently to me, she can't <laughs> handle the basic job of communication internally. <laughs> but see, but she should. She's too concentrated on the media in Washington, D.C. and not enough on her constituency. I hear AOC is one of the worst representatives of her people in Washington. But going back to your first point, right. because she is so much the darling of the media, she'll get reelected for the next 20 years. Yeah, because she's you know, they love her. So. <laughs> And, and and I always want to say, to be fair, like, I'm not trying to pick on the left here. It's, this is just she's my representative is, is someone who's a Democrat. I picked her because I wanted someone new. I didn't want the last person. I didn't want the incumbent to be around. I typically vote against the incumbent as a norm because I'd like to see yeah. some churn there. Um, you know, yeah. if you want term limits, vote your person out. And here's the funny thing. When I bring this up to people, Richard, I'll say, hey, vote your person out. That's how you do term limits. And they're like, whoa, no, I like my guy. I like I like my guy. <laughs> Well, that's your right. (laughs) You can keep them. Just don't tell me I have to have term limits, you know? (laughs) Uh, Well, Pete, I I really love being on your your show. And I got to run a kid up to an orthodontist. Yeah, you got to do that. (laughs) Everybody should get DNA of Democracy. Check it out on Amazon and come back on. Let's do another one maybe like in a few weeks after the election. I would love to, Pete. Okay, great. I'm going to sign us off. Here we go. 